Welcome in, everyone, to another edition of the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. I am your host, as always, Tommy Brzee. It is Tuesday, September 17th around here, and we have a great show for you today. We're going to start talking a little bit about the officiating that happened over this past weekend. It was all over the place. We had a number of calls that went just ways that I did not even think they could go, a number of calls that we need to get into, and then how do we kind of fix this? How do we get this to be in a better place than it is right now? Because right now it's just all over the place. Then we'll get into the winners and the losers from week three. Definitely a lot I want to get into, including a couple around the UGA team. So I'll get into that in in segment two. Then we'll get into the week three uh, whip around, do a couple of games that we just haven't gotten a chance to get to yesterday. Want to make sure I get them on y'all's radar. Then we'll get to questions of the week after week three. Definitely a ton that I have to get to today, and we'll likely continue that into tomorrow before I get into my top 12 teams going into the week four slate. So we'll get that at the very end of the show. Definitely going to be a very interesting top 12, no doubt about that. But before we jump in, I do want to remind you all we get tons of questions and comments throughout the show. And the best way for you all to get your question on the screen, we can have a fun back and forth here, is to use the tip and donation link at the bottom of the screen, gsmcpodcast.net. Or you can use that Super Chat feature at the bottom of the chat on the Sports Network page. Easy, you can just click on that dollar sign, add any question or comment you have, and then it'll pop up on the screen. We can have a fun back and forth here. Sometimes the chat moves a little bit quickly for me to keep track of, so definitely want to utilize that if you need to. Um, But let's jump in right here, and let's talk about the officiating that happened this past weekend, because... It was all over the place. There were about a million different examples I could go through of bad calls this past weekend, and I want to break down a couple right quick uh, before we really jump into how we fix this, because... The reality is something has to be done. Uh, there's too much energy in this sport. There's too many fans. There's too much money for this thing to not be for this to be a problem. For the people wearing white and black to be as big a part of the game as the guys wearing shoulder pads. That should never be the case. I have no earthly idea why we've let it get this far, but. Here we are. So we got to figure out how we fix this, and I think the NCAA kind of has to do something. When we talk about uh, athletic, or when we talk about college football officiating in particular, it's all around different conferences, and it makes no sense. There's no reality where a excuse me, a group of people that are calling the same rules are calling it under different circumstances or being told to call it differently because that's the reality. There are a number of examples of coaches. I believe Mike Gundy did this a couple of weeks ago in the Arkansas game where he was just genuinely confused because there were certain things that that crew was calling that a Big 12 crew normally doesn't call, and that's what he's used to. So it totally changes a game plan. You have to figure out a way to make this at least a group, at least a full-time group where all of these refs come from the same place, they are taught the same exact thing, and they have the same tendencies. Otherwise, you're going to have these type of results that are defined by the refs in a lot of different ways. And Obviously, the best example from this past weekend was South Carolina. They had a number of calls go against them that were just downright terrible. The call on Kyle Kennard, I have no earthly idea how that was called. They, he was a runner at that point. He was a defender. You're supposed to block him. I understand that maybe he didn't need to block him. Doesn't matter. You're supposed to find the quarterback. You're supposed to block the quarterback when he throws a pick. That's just the reality. So I have no earthly idea how they called that and how that was called back because that likely would have ended the game right about there. Um, and then you had a couple others, excuse me, then you had a couple others. You had OPI uh, that was absolutely in- inexplicable. I have no earthly idea what they were looking at on that play. And then Kyron Lacey on the other side had a catch that they called incomplete initially. He took like four steps in bounds before he went down out of bounds. It made no sense to me how that was ever called incomplete and the fact that we had to take time away from the game to review a play that shouldn't have to be reviewed. It should just be a catch and we could keep it moving is insane to me. And there was a number of others. I mean, uh, Brian Kelly said he was sending something to the SEC office on the blocked punt, which I agree. I think that was a penalty. I think he jumped over the... uh, Uh, the personal protector to block the punt, which is not allowed. Now, South Carolina fans don't care about that, and obviously LSU got the nicer part of the deal when it comes to the refs in this game, but the reality is they missed that one too. The refs in that game were just downright terrible, and it's no disrespect to the individuals because the reality is the entire system is messed up. The entire system of the way that we go about business in officiating makes absolutely no sense. But a couple others... Triquez Bridges got kicked out of a game for targeting on this play. He got kicked out of a game for literally targeting Noah Thomas's butt. And I'm not kidding, his butt. 
He hit his butt with his head, and he was kicked out of the game for targeting. He wasn't even near his head. He wasn't near his shoulders. He wasn't even near his abdomen. He was near his butt, and he hit it with his helmet, and he got kicked out of the game. It was one of the most insane calls that I've ever seen in my life, and not what targeting is meant to do. Not what targeting is meant to do, even in the slightest, because I understand that Triquez Bridges hypothetically could have gotten hurt. He didn't. No one got hurt. No one was even close to getting hurt on that play. It is insane that that was called. I don't understand how it was called. I was literally sitting there with my mouth open as that was getting called. I have no earthly idea how targeting has become something where if you drop your head, you can be hitting him in the toe and you get kicked out of the game. It doesn't make sense. It's not what football is about. And then you had a couple others. I mean, Jalen Walker, this isn't the play because I couldn't find a picture of the play, but he had a, a play where... He makes the uh, he makes a sack on um, Brock Vandegrift, gets penalized for roughing the passer because he was driving them into the ground. I don't understand this rule. Ninety nine percent of the time, when people are trying to finish plays, they're gonna drive someone into the ground. It is football. It is going to happen. These things are going to be a little bit dangerous. I understand trying to protect the players. I totally get that. But you're also putting the defenders at a wild disadvantage if Jalen Walker can't finish a play. If he can't finish a sack and his team very badly needs a sack, if he can't do that, then what are we doing? What game are we playing and what sport are we playing going forward? And then we had a, no, a, a number of others. Indiana had one against uh, UCLA. Same exact thing. He's just finishing a tackle. He's just finishing a sack. I understand it definitely puts the quarterback at a little bit of danger. It also puts the defender at danger if they have to think about a million things as they're trying to tackle a guy. So I don't understand this rule. I've never understood it at the NFL or the college level, and I probably will never understand it. Um, and then you had another one in the Oregon-Oregon State game. Wish I could get a picture of this one because this was outright ridiculous. They got uh, Oregon got flagged for roughing the passer, and the Oregon player hit the uh, Oregon State quarterback's arm. He hit it as he was throwing the ball. How could that be roughing the passer? He literally was there as the ball was leaving his hands. I don't understand how we get to this point where all of these different things are called and we have no earthly idea how it's going to be called from one week to the next because you don't know what crew you have in front of you. So there's a number of ways to go about this. And this weekend was just kind of a large spotlight on it more than anything else because it's been happening for quite some time. But there have been a number of coaches that have spoken out about it. I mean, Kirby Smart this past weekend said, feels like everyone in the country is getting more penalties. It feels like everyone is getting a couple more per game, and we just have to figure out a way to stop it. But the reality is his team has been very, very good at avoiding penalties, at avoiding mistakes, and now they're getting penalized a ton. And I promise you, it didn't just happen overnight. It's not just George's fault. And then you had guys like Pat Narduzzi, who was talking out about it, about West Virginia, said he had to beat West Virginia and the refs. And I kind of agree with him. There are a number of calls in that game that were outright ridiculous. And then, obviously, you have Shane Beamer that's sending probably a novel to the SEC offices right about now, um, trying to figure out what happened in that game. Why certain things were called, how were they, uh, how they were called, and how he's supposed to move forward, getting his team prepared to play games with this kind of variable in play. And a couple of stats to kind of put this into perspective: South Carolina LSU had 52 total penalties this, or they both have 52 total penalties this season, the most in the NCAA. 22 refs threw a flag in Williams Bryce Stadium. That's insane. There's no reality where a game should be defined that much by the people that are standing in white and black. That never should be the case. It should always be the guys wearing helmets, wearing shoulder pads that decide this game, and then the coaches. But the refs should just be a supplemental piece to this game. They should just be a way to keep all these kids safe, to make sure that the rules are enforced, and to make sure that there isn't anything going on that aggressively favors one team. They've been not been doing a good job by any means. Also, another stat, South, uh, South Dakota State leads the country with 39 penalties through three games. That is undisciplined. I'm not arguing that it's not. They have more penalties right now than Air Force and Minnesota had all of last season. I promise you it's not just undisciplined football that's getting you there. It's refs calling these games a little closer than they need to and making this way more about the refs than it is about the game. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world. And I think we have to go back to just the organization of this entire thing. There are 10 major conferences in college football. 
every single one has a different officiating system. Every single one in, employs different offici uh, officiating crews, and every single one has different ways that they go about their business. It's not necessarily to say that they're enforcing different rules. They're not. But the Big 12 crews enforce it differently than the SEC crews. That's what Mike Gundy told us after the Arkansas game was very confused how that went about. There is no reality where if you have the same rule book, you have the same set of rules, and they're written down the same way, that they should be enforced differently by different groups. And it's not the ref's fault necessarily because they've been put in an impossible situation. They've been put in a situation where it's their fault on the field. It's not the people's fault who set up the structure where refs can kind of operate under different umbrellas. I don't understand why this isn't a national thing, why we don't have all-time refs, we don't have full-time refs that are employed by the NCAA that have to go about business a certain way and are going about business the same way pretty much across the board. There are going to be variables here and there. Obviously, these are humans. They're going to make not-so-great calls. They're going to make mistakes, all of that type of stuff. But it has to be closer than this. It can't be something that if, say, Texas is getting ready for a Big Ten game down the road, they're getting ready for the Michigan game, and it's being called by a Big Ten crew. If that is something that has to factor into your game plan as you go into the game, we're doing something wrong. If you have to think about how the refs are going to call certain situations as you call plays, then something is going wrong. This is not about the refs, and it's not anything against the individual refs. It's against the system. We have to make this centralized. We have to make this a national thing where all the refs come from one organization, they're all taught one thing, and they go about their business in roughly the same way. It's not going to be perfect, but it has to be so much better than this. This is a very, very successful sport. This is a very successful sport with a lot of money, with a lot of people. People that have the ability to fix this, that have the ability to at least make this a little bit better. And right now, they're sitting on their hands for for what, what I can kind of gather is just laziness. I don't understand why we can't get to a place where we fix this at least a little bit. Just attempt to fix something within the world of uh, officiating because right now, we're looking at this thing and no one has any earthly idea what the actual enforcement of these rules are. At least across the board, we have no standard. We have no reality of this is how it's going to be called no matter who you're playing, no matter where you're playing, no matter what crew is taking care of it. So figure this out. I, I don't understand why this has taken so long. Make it a centralized body and also figure out a centralized body for college football. That's a totally different conversation that is going to take time. I'm not arguing that, but the reality that a group of people that have so much power in our game are not being, are being, you know, essentially just are in different groups around the country and are not following a certain set of the way you're going to go about business is outright insane. I, I don't understand why we haven't gotten to a point where officiating is a great part of the sport but it's not the biggest part of the sport, and this weekend it was, and it should never be the case. So we'll take our first break here, but they got to figure this out as soon as possible. And if they don't, then they're going to start losing some fans because of it, because last, last weekend was just ridiculous. But let's take our first break here, and when we come back, we're going to get into some winners and the losers from Week 3. Definitely a lot of people I want to get into, including Miami fans, just having to have a great time over there in Coral Gables. But we'll break it down right after this, so stick with us.